This time slot is facilitated by the JBDC's Technical Services Department, and that department is responsible for assisting clients with their product development needs from concept to market. And I will tell you a bit more about our services a little later on in the webinar. If you're joining us for the first time, a very special welcome to you. Okay, last week we explored my design DNA and in the previous week we looked at reducing wait time via queue management. And if you missed any of those presentations, you may actually visit our YouTube page, JBDC Jamaica, for access to our virtual content. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to our page for full access. We also have other videos that would have been previously done, or webinars rather, from JBDC in concert, the entrepreneur's journey, as well as JBDC's virtual biz zone. So before we get started with this week's presenters, we actually have two presenters for you this week. And before we get started, I'd just like to highlight normally, sorry, one second. Normally we, we would have put up the notice. I'm not seeing it at this point. However, we would have normally put on your screen that you will be, uh, we, we will be facilitating questions at the end of the webinar. However, at that time, we will ask that you, or the presentations rather, at that time, we will ask that you either click on the icon indicating that you want to raise your hand or you may type your question in the chat and you will be acknowledged at the appropriate time. So I would like to move forward with our presenters this week. This week we are looking at what I believe is a riveting topic. Um, sorry, I had a brain freeze. What I believe is a riveting topic convenient catering during COVID. Okay, and our presenters this week are Miss Alicia Lindsay and Miss Triana Lindo. Now, Miss Lindsay actually has 28 years of experience in the food industry and she does not look it at all. However, she actually ventured into the food industry while she was in high school. She's a graduate of the Hard Trust NTA, where she studied food preparation there. She's also a graduate of the University of Technology, where she did her bachelor's in food service management. Some of her areas of specialization includes fruit and vegetable carving, patisserie, pastry, commercial food preparation. Ms. Lindo, Mr. Anna Lindo, is our senior food technologist and she is actually, she has been in the food industry for 13 years. She is a graduate of the College of Agriculture, Science and Education, where she obtained her bachelor's in agri-production and food systems management. She has certification as well in hazard analysis, critical control points, HACCP, and meat processing and preventive control of human food. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, our presenters for this week, Ms. Triana Lindo and Ms. Alicia Lindsay. Over to you, ladies. Thank you, Daniel. You're welcome. Okay, so let's get started. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. 
today will be presenting on convenient catering during COVID. Okay. And this also covers COVID happening now and post COVID because you know COVID has changed everything. Now, as you all know, we are facing a, a global event. It's not just in Jamaica, it's everywhere, right? And many countries are affected simultaneously. Now, as most of you guys already know, most businesses faced drastic drop in sales, right? Not only that, we have downsizing in human resources. We also had reduction in income, both disposable and otherwise. And there was an availability and still is of some ingredients, right? So what is required as a restaurateur or a caterer or whoever it is that's in food service? What is required to remain relevant? Well, for one, we have to look at shifting our business model, which would mean that if we normally focus on dining, you know, people coming in, dining, the whole environment, there's a shift in that. Most persons are afraid, right? So we have to be focusing now on takeout, right? Um, even with takeout, we have to be relooking that. Takeout, some people don't even want to leave their houses because of you know, the fact that you might catch COVID, you don't know. So you might have to think about doing delivery. And for doing delivery, you have to uh, bear other things in mind, such as contactless delivery or moneyless delivery. So you might need to invest in a card machine, right? Um, applying for one from a bank or so on that your delivery person would have a card machine. So that person don't have to handle money, right? So just use the card, less risk of contamination, moving on. You can also think about curbside pickup. So persons don't even have to come out of the vehicle, right? They call in, they order, they come and pick up, somebody run out and give it to them, right? Another thing is maintaining your social media presence. And this is very important. If your business is not on Instagram or any other social media, it does not even exist, especially knowing this time, right? You have to be advertising your offerings. A lot of persons would see this because now a lot of people are online, so they notice what you have to offer. You have to be posting pictures frequently, in posting customer feedback frequently, and provide information on your menus and your prices and deals, and deals is very important now, as we have said before, you know, a lot of people has lost their jobs because of downsizing or furloughing and stuff like that. So deals are even more important, right? Next slide. All right, so before you can even do all of this, the first step in adapting to change is conducting a risk assessment, right? Finding out what hazards are out there, right? What might you do to prevent these hazards or harms to person? What's the vulnerable areas, right? And finding solutions to fit these. So as we were saying before, whether it's going to be takeout, whether it's going to be delivery, all of that, all right? The next thing is managing your stock levels. You have to ensure that you have the um, correct stock in place, your raw material. Ensure that your, whatever you have, make sure that their dates are current, right? Nothing is past date, right? Um, check and ensure that you, are in, you can get your raw materials, right? Because you know that with COVID and a lot of places closed down, then some raw material um, became scarce, you know? For mm -hmm. a few, like shortly before the whole COVID lockdown properly happened, we couldn't get garlic. Garlic was scarce and a bunch of other things, right? So you know that, yes, there's going to be a scarcity of in raw materials during COVID, and there's going to be a scarcity of raw material after everything opens up, right? So you have to ensure that you take stock, do your right inventory, get your necessary raw material, right? You also need to get adequate consumables, and consumables are like your disposable items, your your cling wrap, whatever else 
you will need. Maintain your machinery and equipment. During the lockdown in COVID, a lot of persons, you know, closed down their business and so on, and a lot of machinery you know, was not being used. So you know that with this, you need to ensure that you are you know, making sure that your scales and your whatever equipment that needs to be calibrated are calibrated and passed. Ensure that your equipment that needs to be serviced are serviced. Right? Um, retrain your staff. And a, a lot of us have realized that there was some serious shortcomings with the advent of COVID. With COVID coming up, we realized that there was some things that was necessary and we were not paying enough attention to them. So retraining your staff, especially when it comes to do with food health, safety, and sanitation, right? So we have to ensure that we retrain our staff with that. With the whole COVID situation and the change in how we do things, we also have to train our staff to ensure that they are up to par with the new change in our modus operandi. So whether it's going to be answering the phone, customer service, um, going out to, to deliver and stuff like that, making sure that they are always aware of sanitation and safety. It's very important also that we provide the proper PPEs for our staff, which would include gloves, apron, disposable aprons, all of those things. We have to ensure that our hair is covered, even though COVID, it is said that COVID cannot really be transmitted through the food and it's mainly transmitted through people. But showing that your place is sanitary, that you bear this in mind, you're stressing food safety and the importance of it will also build confidence in your clientele and your customers and also your employees. Provide face masks and shields. Persons who are in eye contact areas, such as your cashiers and receptionists, hostess, whoever, always ensure that they are protected. Reinforce social distancing. Now, when we, are, we have reopened and we are now having seating, and that is going to happen. Right? We still have to ensure that we enforce social distancing. So your tables have to be far enough apart, which is three or six feet apart. Right? You have to ensure that the persons who are waiting, you have your designated areas so that they'll stand in these areas and will help to protect us. Even though COVID might have slowed down, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is over. We also have to ensure that we adjust our restaurant cleanliness and sanitation plans or schedules with the new considerations and guidelines. We know that all eye touch areas have to be sanitized on a regular basis. And this also will instill confidence in our clients and customers. We have to be adjusting our recipes to offer current trends and demands. And to also bearing in mind that, listen, a lot of people do not have a lot of money for um, purchasing stuff. Right? Now, some of the current trends in, in food service. Right? People are now focusing on simple, healthy, clean, immune boosting, affordable food options. And it has to be convenient. Now, for simple and clean foods, now, when we say in clean foods, we normally mean food that's foods that do not contain a lot of additives. The flavors are crisp and clean. They're unidentifiable. There's not a lot of MSG and other stuff that a lot of people are moving away from, right? Healthy foods. We need foods that are rich in vitamins and minerals. All of those minerals and nutrients that are naturally occurring in our foods which actually calls for creativity. So I think that's one of the things that we should have here, creativity. That is very important. 
And since we know that COVID does not have any cure, and we don't have any real medicine so far to treat it, we have to be preventative, right? And a lot of people are thinking along that line. So they are more interested in immune boosters. And you having foods on your menu that has immune boosters in it is very important and would also help with you getting more clients and customers. Right? And we know that foods that are immune boosters, they assist with preventing and fighting off infections. Right? Such foods are like garlic, for example, foods such as garlic, citrus, ginger, turmeric, bell peppers, sweet pepper, broccoli, green leafy vegetables, and this could be lettuce and callaloo, which is our more popular, I mean, more readily available and very cost effective item, and spinach, as well as others. Right? And these are just examples. There's a whole lot, but these are just a few. The other trend is that we try to keep an affordable menu. Again, because we know that a lot of persons have lost their job. So they, they, our income level, our disposable income, our monies are lower than they were before. So we have to be thinking about ways to ensure that yes, our customers are being taken care of. And we're also cognizant of the fact that they do not have a lot of money. Most persons do not have a lot of money to be spending. Yeah. And especially when it comes to vegetables, because we have found now that because there's currently a scarcity with the vegetables, the prices are way high. But we still have to think about how can we still ensure that our customers get all the nutrients that they need. They have to. So. We have some examples of affordable immune boosting menu items. And these are, so, I mean, some of you guys already know a lot of them, but it is very important that we look at some of them. The fact that we have to ensure that these items, um, the, food, the food items that we offer in our restaurants is nutrient dense that it is, it's high in, in immune boosting ingredients, right? And we have to ensure that these ingredients are in, maintained at the end of the cooking process. So we have to be thinking about ensuring that we do not overcook our items. Right? We're thinking about using a lot of stir frying, blanching our vegetables before stir frying so that they do not overcook because we're waiting on we're waiting on the, the carrots to cook or the broccoli to cook and therefore the other um, I, um, ingredients that cook at a faster pace would be overcooked because of that. Okay? So we have to blanch, stir fry or even steam and these would ensure that the ingredients that are in your menu items still has most of their nutrients at the end of the cooking process. So the menu items that we'll be featuring today is easy rosemary garlic chicken, the immune boosting ingredients, rosemary, garlic, lime or lemon, onion, ginger. The next item is honey garlic pork chops. And this, the immune boosting ingredients is honey, garlic and ginger. We also have vegetable rice pilaf, which is vegetables, which is really good for you. Onion, garlic, sweet pepper for this one. Some persons also include ginger and turmeric, which is a consideration. And as I said, it is done. Right? And turmeric is very good for in immune boosting and inflammation, anti-inflammatory. Garlic, herbs, sweet potato stocks, and this is garlic, sweet pepper, right? Um, as I said before, 
You can also add turmeric to this one. These recipes are basic as is. I mean, you can, do, you can use them as is, they're really good. And you can also adjust them to suit your, your in restaurant or your needs. And to make them yours, because I always recommend and encourage chefs to always, whatever recipe you're using, adjust them to suit your needs. Make them yours. Okay. The next recipe that we're going to look at is Oriental Stir Fried Vegetables. And that has broccoli, garlic, sweet pepper, onion, and ginger. Then there's the breadfruit salad. And I always recommend that we use our indigenous foods, foods that are readily available. And you know, those are actually cheaper. And that is a breadfruit, sweet pepper, garlic, and onion. Now, we are discussing, we are in encouraging that we rethink our way of doing things normally and try our best to reduce or try to reduce the cost of our menu as much as we can, bearing in mind that a lot of persons do not have a lot of money. So if you notice on this slide, we have the approximate total cost. And for most things, except the pork chops, we try to keep it below a thousand dollars. And these are all the recipes that we are going to be showing today. They are for five persons, or they do five servings depending on how you serve, right? Because um, the rice pilaf can do more than five person if you do one cup per serving, right? So for the rosemary chicken, the rosemary garlic chicken, we use 10 pieces of chicken. In this recipe, we use the leg and thigh. That can be changed, it's not written in stone. We have two heads of garlic, which we crush, two sprigs of fresh rosemary, or you can use a pack of dried rosemary. You won't use the entire pack. You know, rosemary is very, very strong. One cup of chopped onions, quarter cup of parsley flakes, half cup of lemon juice, okay, salt, and pepper to taste. So this is a recipe that is going to require your oven which makes it healthier. You know, it's not deep fried, it's not oily. If you're going to preheat your oven to 375 degrees or 190 degrees Celsius, and you're going to rub on or cover your chicken with your garlic, your onion, your rosemary, parsley, your lime juice, your salt and pepper. And you're going to place it on your sheet pan, okay? Now, I like to line my sheet pan because it makes it easier to clean at the end of the day. It's quicker. Then you pour your chicken broth or your water. And some persons like to use a little bit of orange juice. That can work as well. And you pour that onto your chicken. You're going to cover it with aluminum foil. And then you're going to bake it in your preheated oven for 35 minutes or until done. And this is going to be dependent on the thickness of your chicken because you know some chicken breast is larger than some chicken thigh and leg is larger than some. And you'll serve this hot with your choice of carbohydrate. Now for a sauce, you can remove the drippings from that. You can have some um, tomato paste, more rosemary and garlic with your lime juice and make an, a reduction. And you can use that as your sauce. So you would have a strong, nice, rosemary flavor to go with your chicken. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so this is a picture of the rosemary chicken that we did. Okay. We did a reduction for this second picture and some nice blanched carrots wedges. The next item is your honey garlic pork chop. And the approximate cost for that is $1,962.50. And this again is five servings. So we use pork chops 
the ones that we use for boning is salt and pepper. We use garlic powder, the olive oil, the salted butter. Eight cloves of garlic, which is less than one egg. One third cup honey, one third cup water or chicken broth, and two and a half tablespoons of rice wine vinegar. You can choose to use whichever vinegar you have. So it's not, as again, it's not written in stone. You can use the rice wine vinegar, apple cider vinegar, white vinegar, any vinegar that you choose to have. Or you can substitute the vinegar for lime juice. No. You can choose to use your broiler or your grill. Or you can use your skillet. So you have a choice. This item, this, this, this recipe can be done totally in your skillet. Or you can choose to use your broiler or your grill. If you want to have the charred and nice smoke flavor. Right. So for step one, you know, you preheat your broiler or your grill if you're going to be using it and ensure that it gets nice and hot. You season your chops with salt and pepper, garlic powder, and then you're going to preheat, you're going to put your um, you're going to sear your pork chops. Now, there is two things if you notice in one and two. You can preheat your grill, sear your pork chops until it's hot on both sides and golden. Then you're going to put it in a plate. Then you, then you know that, boy, you can put it back, you can finish it on your grill, right? If you want to do it that way. Or you can put it in your pot, cook it on both sides, right? Put it on a plate. Then you're going to melt your butter, scrape up all the bits, saute your garlic, your onion, right? your ginger, until they're fragrant. Then you're going to add your honey and your water, right? Your vinegar or your lime juice. Then you're going to add the pork chops back to the pan, cover it and cook it until it's tender and the juice is reduced. The, the sauce, the juices from it and the, the, with the liquid and the water and the vinegar, all of that is reduced and thickened slightly. And this with copper wood pork is 15 to 20 minutes. With this, you'll be turning the pork occasionally. Right. So for the one that we did, we didn't use the grill or the broiler. We did it totally in the pan. So this is ours. So if you don't have a grill, then you know that you can actually do this recipe. You can complete, execute this recipe without your grill at all. All right. The next recipe that we looked at was the vegetable rice pilaf. And this is the approximate cost. And this is four or five servings, if the servings are generous. The approximate total cost is $459.75 for the five servings. So we'd be using four tablespoons of vegetable oil one onion, which we dice, garlic, celery, carrots, bell peppers, salt, black pepper, onion, parsley, long grain rice, vegetable stock, coconut milk, or water. Now, for this recipe, we can adjust it. You can use your frozen meat vegetables instead of fresh vegetables. And those actually at this time would be cheaper and more readily available than vegetables that are actually in the market. Right? So we know that right now, um, bell peppers is $200, $250 a pound some places. And carrot is around that one. You know. So using the frozen um, vegetab mixed vegetables would work out cheaper. So, so the instructions, you're going to eat your olive oil in a medium saucepan, over medium heat. You're going to add your chopped vegetables and your seasonings, your salt, and your pepper, and you're going to cook these until they're soft. If you're using your frozen vegetables, you know you'd bring it, you'd, 
you bring it to room temperature or thaw it out before you use it. And you're going to add it in the first section where you're going to be sauteing your vegetables with your seasoning. Then you're going to add your rice and you're going to coat it. Increase the heat a little bit. You're going to add your vegetable stock or your water or your coconut milk. I like to use coconut milk because it gives the rice such a wonderful flavor. And it kind of reminds me of Sunday rice and peas with all the peas. I don't really like peas. And your scallion, you're going to add your scallion and your parsley. And you're going to raise the heat, as I said before, and you're going to bring it to a boil. As soon as it reaches a boil, you're going to know you eat and cover your pot and basically steam your rice, just like how you cook regular rice until the rice is tender, which would be about 15 to 18 minutes. You're going to remove from eat, you're going to leave it for five minutes, which is what we do with most things, five to 10 minutes, so that it would you know, get nice and soak up and get tender and fluffy and all that. And then you're going to discard your scallion, fluff your rice and serve with whatever protein you choose or desire. So this is pictures of us doing the vegetable rice pillar. The picture on the right is us cooking it before we add the stock. So you know you coat it and you can notice, if you notice on the spoon, the rice has gotten a little bit transparent. So you're coating it with all of this goodness, the flavor of the seasonings and fat and so on, so that you have a really nice, tender, delicious rice. And that is the example of the picture on your left is a bowl of the completed rice. Okay. So our next menu item is the garlic sweet potato stock. And this one is basically a baked or roasted sweet potato, but it's done differently. Instead of having your whole sweet potato, we're going to be slicing it, right? So for this recipe, you're going to need four tablespoons of melted butter, two tablespoons of olive oil, one tablespoon, in, sorry, one teaspoon of thyme leaf, one garlic clove, and you're going to crush that, three pounds of large sweet potatoes scrub, and three spoons of parsley flakes. So you can either buy the parsley dried or you can chop fresh parsley if you can get it. Right. And that is right. So and then for finishing, and this is optional because if you're if you're catering to persons who do not eat meat, vegan or vegetarian, then you know you would really had the Parmesan cheese. So your first step in your instructions, you're going to preheat your oven to 220 degrees Celsius and line your roasting pan with baking paper or foil paper. And as I said before, this actually assists with cleaning up. You're going to combine your butter, your oil, your thyme, and your garlic in your large bowl. You're going to whisk your seasoning together with a fork and set it aside. Slice your sweet potatoes about two millimeters thick, about there. So you don't want them too thick that it takes really long to roast, but you want them thick enough that they won't break apart. You're going to add your sliced sweet potatoes that you have already scrubbed and cleaned to your bowl with your seasoning and your butter, and you're going to toss it to coat. And you're going to stack your potatoes, as the recipe says, sweet potato stock. You're going to stack your slices into five. So you're going to put five slices per pile. And then you can use a toothpick if your pile is not holding in, in place as you would want if they're sliding off. You can use a toothpick to secure them in place. You place them on your baking pan and you bake for about 25 minutes or until the potatoes are tender and the edges are golden. One of the ways to assist with this so that the potatoes doesn't dry out is to cover the entire, cover the pan with um, aluminum foil. And this will help the potatoes to steam. You can put a few tablespoons of water in there to help your potatoes to steam. When your potatoes are cooked and tender, you remove your foil. And at that point, you, know, you can scatter 
your Parmesan cheese and pasta flakes on top. And then you can bake it for a little bit longer, like a further 10 minutes until the tops are brown and the parsley is crisp. So you can remove it, you can remove your toothpicks and serve. Now for serving, if you're using a Parmesan cheese, you can scatter or sprinkle a bit more Parmesan cheese when you're serving. If you're not, you can top it with some parsley flakes and some pepper flakes. Pepper flakes tend to look really nice. This is an example of our sweet potato. It's pan. Oriental stir fried vegetables. The approximate total cost for the oriental stir fried vegetables, as I said, a serving of five, is $495.20. For the ingredients, no. This recipe takes a bit of pre prepping. And for those persons who have done oriental um, recipes before, you know that a lot of it is pre prepping. A lot of the time spent is pre prepping. So you have your ingredients for your vegetables and you have your ingredients separately for your seasoning or your sauce. For the vegetables, we use one and a half cups broccoli, one and a half cups cauliflower or cabbage, two medium carrots, one and a half cup snow peas or string beans, one cup red bell peppers. For your seasoning, you need one teaspoon salt, three quarter teaspoon sugar, your black pepper or cayenne pepper or white pepper or scotch bonnet pepper, whichever one you have, one tablespoon oyster sauce, quarter teaspoon corn flour, two tablespoons water, one tablespoon chopped garlic, and one tablespoon vegetable oil. Okay. So first step after getting your ingredients together, you'll have to prep your vegetables. So you cut your broccoli and cauliflower into florets. If you're using your cabbage, you're going to rough chop your cabbage. So you won't be doing really small slices. You want them big enough that when you're stir frying, they don't overcook. You want them to look really nice, crisp, fresh, clean when you're presenting them to your customers. So you're going to peel your carrots and you're going to cut it into oblong wedges. Remove your, your strings from your snow peas or remove the stem from your string beans right, and trim them to about three inches in length. Cut your red peppers into triangles. As I said, you can do them in rough chop or you can do them in large buttons or julienne, depending on how you want to go about it. You're going to blanch your vegetables. And by blanching your vegetables, I mean you're going to blanch your cauliflower, your broccoli, and your carrots. And you're going to set those aside. You're going to eat up your vegetable oil in your wok. You're going to saute your garlic until it's fragrant. Add your salt, sugar, brown, your white pepper or your red pepper or your cayenne pepper, oyster sauce, corn flour, water. And you're going to add those to your pan. You're going to cook them until they're translucent or cook the sauce until the cornstarch isn't white anymore. That's what I mean by translucent. Then you add your blanched vegetables and stir fry them until they're fragrant dish it out and serve it. And that's one way of doing your stir fry. The other way is actually sauteing them and adding your sauce after. But both ways work, okay? And this is an example of our oriental stir fried vegetables. Breadfruit salad. And this is our last recipe last menu idea. Now this use five this use five cups of breadfruit and we are going to boil our breadfruit and dice our breadfruit. Now we can do it um, whether it's going to be slice of breadfruit 
peel it and boil it and then dice it or peel a breadfruit, um, pair it, dice it and then boil it. Whichever way you do it, it doesn't really matter. Okay. One stalk celery, which you're going to dice as well. You can use black beans, one tin black bean and that's drained and that would actually add some protein to your salad, but the black bean is optional. You don't have to add that. You can use one tin of mixed vegetables or frozen vegetables, which would be one cup. Frozen mixed vegetables, which as we said before, is really good because it is now readily available and it tends to have more nutrient content or nutritional content than the tinned one. One cup red bell peppers diced, and it's up to you as to your size. Two tablespoon onion grated, two teaspoons salt and pepper to taste, one tablespoon parsley. And if you're using the fresh parsley, you chop that, or you can use the dried parsley flakes. One clove garlic grated, and three quarter cup mayonnaise. And this again is five servings. As I said, five servings relative based on how you serve. So instructions, wash and cut, wash, cut and peel your breadfruit and boil it in salted water until fork tender. You can cool it and dice your boiled breadfruit. As I explained before, you can do it whichever way is, more, is comfortable to you. In a large bowl, you're going to add your diced breadfruit, your peas if you're using it, your mixed vegetables, celery, red peppers, your onion, your parsley, your garlic, salt, and pepper. You're going to toss in with your mayonnaise. You cover this and place in the refrigerator and chill cover for one hour. This is a salad, so you serve it chilled. Okay. So these are some of the menu ideas that you can incorporate, work around, or you can add to your um, your current menu, which would be very creative, right? Now, um, another thing that you can add is, which is not in the list, right? And we have to keep bear in mind that there are persons out there who do not eat meat. They are vegans or vegetarians. And for this now, we can think of doing uh, a bean stew, right? We can do a mixed bean stew, which would involve, which would incorporate red peas and lentils, split peas, or um, as well as garbanzo beans, which is chickpeas. And we would put that down in coconut milk. So that's one of the ideas that we can look at now. Another trend in, well, mainly abroad, in the, in, in the vegan in culinary world is that they're using a lot of faux meat ideas, which would be like green jackfruit. And if you go online and you look this up, you'll find that you can use green jackfruit to substitute for meat. It is iron protein and it can be used to um, as it, it really looks like meat when you cook it, you know, and you can do curry, barbecue. It does a really good pulled pork, so good vegan pulled pork. So good that some persons are unaware that it's actually pork when they taste it. And we have tried that recipe and it does work, right? So, you know, we can try that. So you ensure that throughout all your offerings, you do have vegan or vegetarian options as well because a lot of people know this is, this is a market, this is an industry, a part of the industry that is really expanding and growing. They really have to bear in mind and take them into consideration as well when you're planning your menu. Thank you. Okay, so these are examples. Now on the right, your breadfruit, it's a breadfruit salad that we have done. This is in the bowl mixing. 
and the second one is served. As you notice, we have topped it with red pepper flakes and parsley flakes. So now we'll be going on to packaging materials with Miss Triana Linda. Hi everyone. All right, so I'll just continue from where Alicia left off and we'll be looking at how, what are some considerations when we're packaging our food for delivery? I'm sure she just gave you some appetizing meals and of course you not want when you've prepared that, you've done all the work in preparing the meal, and then when it gets to your customer, it's definitely not the same or not as appetizing. So what exactly do we need to consider? First of all, we need to ensure that the food quality and the safety is maintained. So your goal should be to deliver food and drink under sanitary and untampered conditions. So one of the first thing is to separate the components by temperature. Say for example, you're preparing a salad. You have your raw vegetable, lettuce and tomato, and you want to top that with chicken. And of course, maybe a dressing. Now, if you put that hot chicken onto the lettuce, then of course, by the time it gets to the customer, then you may not have your crispy, fresh lettuce anymore, right? And if you should pour the, um, the dressing on top of it, then definitely it would look soggy. And then of course, not appealing to the customer when they get it. So you may want to use separate containers for the dressing, and you may even need to use a separate container for the chicken as well. Although there is the option of serving the chicken cold, but it depends on who your customers are. Secondly, you want to choose purpose designed containers. Use containers that are made for its purpose. So if you're serving soup, do not put that in a plastic container or one that will not be able to retain the heat of that food item. So you choose, the, choose the packaging according to the food ingredient. All right. Thirdly, make sure that food stays in its, in its lane. You want well-sealed components of all your orders. You don't want any, any spillage, right? You want to seal it properly so that um, by the time it does get gets to the consumer, it won't be half of the contents left in the package, all right? Fourthly, keep food safe before pickup. If it's hot, keep it hot. And if it's a cold food, then of course you keep it in the refrigerator. So you may need to have a food warm and you may need to have a refrigerator while, while the food items are waiting to be picked up because the delivery may be outsourced and not necessarily provided by you. Fifth, prevent the just a taste tampering. I know a lot of us in recent times saw a video going around on social media where a food delivery person was actually helping themselves to some of the meal that they were delivering. Now, this is definitely a no-no and it can be, it can be um, you know, a huge, what I would say no, it can, it can cause you to lose business because if you're not able to guarantee the safety of the food that you're sending to your customers, then of course they are going to, to lose all the confidence, confidence that they had before. All right, so we want to prevent this kind of activity. And of course, work with reputable delivery business. 
there are lots, lots of persons out there who some even started their business while COVID happened. Um, some had it before, of course, but you know that the demand is going to be a lot greater because persons are not willing to leave their homes. And even if they do leave their homes to come and pick up, they, of course, it is still reduced. All right, so what you want to do is to ensure that these persons, um, their customer service is on point, their cleanliness is also on point, and they are, they of course, their business values are in line with yours. All right, one way to ensure that you know we can pre prevent that um, tampering is to use tamper-proof seals. Now these are seals or stickers and you can use them for different reasons. You could use them to, to tell your customer that the food that they're getting is in fact fresh, right? And it also helps to boost the consumer's confidence that the food has not been tampered with from the time that it left your establishment to the time that it gets to them. Now these are just two examples. So on your left, so that's just a tamper, that's a tamper proof seal. So it's pretty much a sticker that you place over the opening of the, of the food container. Now, if you should lift that, then the seal would be broken. Now, if the food gets to the consumer and it is broken, now that would definitely send a right signal. You say to them that, yes, maybe it's possible that this food was tampered with. All right, so you want to do things like these to ensure, you know, or for consumers to to, to, re, to retain the, the confidence that they had in your food and your brand. On your right is another form of tamper-proof um, seal, but this one also gives them the assurance of freshness because it tells the date that the food was prepared and the time, all right? And I'm sure you know in food service, there are certain um, time period in which you can prepare a meal and so the time between it's prepared and, and consumption, um, it, it's not, it hasn't passed that. All right, so, you, so that would be a good um, option. Now this, now this slide shows you what will happen if the seal is broken, if, some, if the delivery person tried to um, take a taste of this food. Now these seals are, we may look and say, okay, it is going to be costly for our business, but we really should not focus too much on the cost, much more about um, maintaining your, your customer base for one. And of course, ensuring that the food that you provide for them is safe. And at the end of the day, now these, you can get, you can purchase them on Amazon. You can get a roll of 500 for under $20. Or simply if you want to make them yourself, you could just design something on the computer and have them print you up the, any one of the many printing houses that we have here locally. Anything that you need to do to help to, you know, retain your consumer's confidence is important. And of course, food safety, because that is ultimate. Now, segregating and sealing food. Reduce the risk of giving customers leaky containers by placing all your sauces and your dresses in their own containers. Now, this will prevent spillage. You could also seal containers that hold liquid like your soups. As also as we just mentioned, it could be drinks as well with plastic wrap for a cheaper option. But of course, this would have to be several um, times you may need to wrap that band around, the, around the, the, the lid. Now, these are some examples of how you can segregate food. Now, in one container on your left, so you have your nicely prepared salad and the sauce being put in its own container, then your carbohydrate and your protein. So you are segregating the liquid food from the dry food that at the same time you're um, separating it based on nutrient type. The second picture shows um, the sauce being separated at all. This is more like a dipping sauce, but it's in its own container. Your soup, no. Remember that the prime, well, they, they have, no, the, the, the thrust is now for us to use more environmentally friendly packaging. So on the left, you have um, soup. 
in the in a paperboard container, but one that is fits the purpose for the food that it's holding. So it can retain the heat of that soup. So when you get it, it will not be cold. And of course, you could further secure this package by using the shrink band that's on, on the right, putting that around the top of the lid and just using a little heat. If you could simply buy a heat gun or even a regular home dryer could be used. But of course, it's as I said, it still ensures that the food is not tampered with. And for your smoothies, you could get the tapes and that goes over the spout. That's where you insert your straw when you get it. Now you want to keep hot and cold food separately. As we mentioned before, imagine that you ordered your favorite meal, you know, from your, your favorite restaurant and it arrives cold. Now two things may happen right, if your customer should order and get cold food. They will either order from you for the last time or they may just eat it because they've already spent their money, but at the same time, they may not come back. And they may tell somebody else as well. So you definitely don't want to do such a thing. So it's a very important to, to, to keep, to separate the food. Temperature is just as important as taste, right? You want the food to taste good, but if you're supposed to be consuming soup, a hot soup, you expect it to have, be of a certain temperature. But then when you get it, it's cold. Definitely not something to look forward to. Now, transporting hot and cold foods together is probably one of the reasons why you may have such a situation. So it is good to definitely separate them. And at the same time, we want to use packaging that is insulated so to help to keep the hot foods hot and the cold foods cold, right? Now, these are some examples of carrier bags. So it's always a good thing to invest in something like this. Um, you have different types. I know this is going to be, you can choose based on the type of food that you're offering. And you do have some that you can carry by handle. If you're using a motor vehicle, say, such as a car, to do your delivery, then op oops, sorry, options one and two, you know, could be used. Even the two and three down, down the bottom of the slide, you could use that as well. But if the person is using a bike for delivery, then you may want that can they can just quickly um, slip on their back and go out for delivery. Now these are some common you know businesses that are offering delivery service. Not that we're not necessarily promoting I know of in some sort any of these business per se, but in doing our research, we found that these are um, delivery services that persons are using and they are reputable sources. And that is exactly what you really want because you, you don't want a recurrence of um, the food tampering or the delivery person eating out your food, eating out the customer's food. Now this flow chart here, it shows from the order comes in, how you can secure your package until it gets to the consumer. So they would probably order the food using an app online or they could call it to place an order. Now you package your food nicely in this container you, you know, you separate, and of course you segregate the components and then you may want to affix two tamper-proof seals on the sides. But let's say you put it on only one side, then of course they could easily open it from another side. So using two seals here would be um, a good idea. Then that packaging now goes into a paper bag of course, again, it has another tamper-proof seal. So you have two options here. You could pack it in a paper bag like this, or you do have the recyclable plastic bags. And that is one other type of, um, that's one other type of tamper-proof seal that you could use. All right, then you're going to nicely package the food items in the insulated bag. The delivery person can quickly take that and um, deliver to the consumer. And that's the person, and that's you receiving your food in the same condition that it was in the restaurant, of course, maintaining the right temperature so you can enjoy your meal. Because what people, what people really wanted, they want that same dining experience they would have if we didn't, or if we were not experiencing a pandemic. 
Now, some food safety reminders. Now, all individuals coming in contact or handling food needs to have a food handler's permit. And this includes the delivery persons. Other persons now are taking on drivers or riders, delivery riders, and I'm not sure if the necessary checks are being done, but that it is important as the, the entrepreneur to ensure that these persons meet your requirements. First, you need to have some requirements. So they must have a food handler's permit because the basic knowledge of personal hygiene and food handling and sanitation is key. Now, you need to provide the necessary training for your staff. Let us say they didn't have, or they just have some. Nothing is wrong with retraining, right? Because sometimes we forget information so you can you know, reinforce it. Proper hygiene is key, clean, key. clean clothes. That is definitely important. Um, be well groomed. And um, both, as I said, both personal and environmental hygiene is necessary. Impress upon your staff to wear their mask and their face shield or mask or face shield when they're coming in contact with persons. And we may want to think that persons are really scorning others, but it's not that. Nobody wants to catch this virus because as we would have seen in the media, it is, it is something that can be really, really scary. And especially for someone who may have some underly underlying health condition. Now some other food safety um, reminders, handle food safe. So you keep that safe temperatures, um, use refrigerated vehicles if necessary, or you know, trans containers, portable coolers or insulated bags. Um, keep your hot foods above at 65 degrees or above right out of the danger zone and your cold, cold foods at four degrees celsius or below and of course you know frozen foods must be kept frozen solid if that is what your offering is food safety reminders again keep it clean you wash your hands with soap and water no amount of sanitizer that you use can get rid of all of that um, germs dirt that is that is on your hands washing is important Using a sanitizer helps, yes, but it does not prevent or should, should not stop you from washing your hands. But of course, if you, if you don't have it at that time, then use it. But definitely washing your hands every 20 seconds, not 20 seconds, sorry. Washing your hands very frequently for at least 20 seconds is important. So you want to do this before you start your deliveries after you use the restroom, after finishing deliveries, before you eat. There are many persons, I mean, who may smoke, you want to do it before and after that as well. As often as you can, you should wash your hands and with soap and water. Disinfect frequently touched surfaces like the doors, um, cards, transportation equipment, faucet handles inside of the vehicle. Most persons are using bike, nothing is wrong with sanitizing down the bike, use that the sanitizer or the alcohol and spray down the, the bike. The same packaging or insulated container that you use to do your delivery, that also needs to wipe down inside and outside of it. And you can't just say, all right, the next person who is going to um, do a delivery can do it. No, you need to do it after each delivery, so before and after each delivery. Now, while delivering food, delivery workers should use hand sanitizers before they pick up those bags from the vehicles, right? You don't necessarily need to wear gloves. When persons wear gloves, they tend to, tend to forget that their hands may be dirty. And so I personally do not like gloves, right? Because you may want to, I don't know, but persons just love the gloves and they'll touch anything. They'll even touch their face. They touch other, other, other things, such as water, touch services, and at the same time, then still forget that um, they should sanitize. So even if you had on the gloves, you definitely would still need to sanitize that. And what persons tend to do to, to, to not remember that that is important. And so you don't necessarily need to wear a glove, just use your sanitizers on your hands. But if that is your choice, still sanitize the gloves. Wear a face covering that covers your nose and your mouth, so you could use um, masks. There are many different kinds of masks available um, out there. A lot of um, entrepreneurs, you know, that started making their own. And then you have, have the N95 masks that they use in the medical um, field. 
avoid handling cash. So encourage encourage your partic your customers to pay using a card. Or could be that create a mobile app where persons may place their order and of course do all the payments online. So all you need to do is now deliver the food to the customer. Always stand six feet away from, from others, especially, especially when you're going out for when you when you need to. Call or text your customer that their food is being delivered so that they can prepare for it. So that it doesn't really slow you down in delivering. Um, the food to your next client. Do not go inside a customer's home even if they invite you to, right? Even if it's a lot, ask them to get some assistance. All right, and now we've come to the end of our presentation I, and we are now open to any questions. Okay, thank you very much, ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, our presenters gave us some very interesting recipes as well as some very good information on food safety requirements and packaging solutions that we can explore during this season. So if you have any questions, please either click on the icon to raise your hand or you may actually just type your question in the chat and we will acknowledge you from there. So are there any questions for our presenters? All right, so I have not seen any questions yet. However, Alicia, I noticed that you put forward five recipes that um, we could utilize or that persons could explore during this time within their businesses. You said they're affordable. And uh, is there any potential that people could interchange some of these ingredients to you know, add a bit more flexibility Let's say, you know, if they're doing catering and they want to spice it up a little bit and don't want to just keep it, you know, monotonous. Are there any other suggestions that we could bear in mind for that? Thank you, Daniel. Yes, as I've said in the presentation, most of the recipes that I have presented today can be adjusted to suit your taste. And I normally recommend that you do because different persons might have different menu items say you don't have breadfruit but you have yam that can be used as well so yes you can change your menu based on what is available to you and what is cost effective to you if you do not have as i said before if you do not have cauliflower you can use cabbage okay and, and, and so you, on and so forth do you recommend in the food preparation process now, everything has changed a little bit as it pertains to COVID. I'm not sure if perhaps you or Triana will take this question, but will you, is it the proper thing now to be preparing the food in a mask? I know you spoke, Triana spoke about sanitizing and you know the usuals that would be there before in terms of the hair net and everything else, but going forward, will that be the protocol that will be considered? I'm not sure if your Triana wants to take that. Okay. Well, as far as the mask, it is dependent also on the establishment and the type of food that you prepare. If it's going to be food that is not going to be cooked, then we would recommend, especially if the, the environment is conducive, that you wear a mask. As was said by the WHO, the COVID virus is not actually transmitted through food. It's con transmitted through um, droplets, persons talking, um, you know, the saliva catching you, coughing, sneezing, and stuff like that. And once the food is cooked properly, 
then you know that even if it was contaminated with any kind of virus, it would have been killed. E. coli, salmonella, COVID, whatever. But if it's going to be salads and so on, maybe we could take that precaution of wearing masks while preparing your salads, as well as your gloves are, washing your hands and ensuring that you follow all the other regulations to ensure that you are safe and sanitary food. Okay, thank you very much, Alicia. We actually have some questions. Violet Reynolds is asking if we will be posting the recipe. As I had stated earlier, this video will be available on YouTube following um, the presentations or after today, it will be posted to our YouTube channel, JBDC Jamaica. If however you want to contact our food service specialist, food service development specialist, you may contact her through the JBDC to get access to some of these recipes. And you may send an email to alindsay at jbdc.net or info at jbdc.net so that we can perhaps explore some of the recipes. Or you may try and contact them via telephone. You may call 876-758-39668 so that you can get additional information if you don't want to just focus on the YouTube um, video that will be posted there. Okay, we actually have another question from Sheldon Hay. And he's asking, how would package, how would you package, I believe, sweet confectionery items such as candy or coconut drops for sale and delivery to customers? I believe this would probably be Triana. Okay, hi, Sheldon. All right, so you have, there's a variety of ways in which you can package your confectionery for your customer. It depends on you know, what section of the market you're tapping into. Because simply you could just use a regular um, plastic, well, not a polyethylene bag, but of course one that is has a greater thickness, maybe like a, vac like, like a vacuum seal bag, you could pack them in that, seal them using an impulse sealer, and of course a fixing a label onto it. But then there are other options. You could use the aluminum foil bags um, which of course would offer greater protection. But I think what, based on, on your question, it seems you already have an existing business or you want to start going business. So maybe this would require um, a more detailed consultation. So you could contact me at the number Dania just um, gave. And so we can have further discussions or you could simply put your email address and contact information, send it to us and we'll make contact with you. Okay, we have another question from Maxim Losev, who, well, we kind of touched on it a bit earlier, you know, we really asking about the mask. However, he's asking, what procedures do you need to have in the kitchen while preparing food? Meaning, what do you need to wear? Can you please repeat that? Okay, he's asking, what procedures do you need to have in the kitchen while pre preparing food? Mainly, what do you need to wear? Well, no, regularly preparing foods, you know we have to wear our PPEs, which is our head covers, our apron, um, chef jackets, and so on. And that hasn't changed. But you know we have to take the extra precaution of constantly um, sanitizing our work environment even more than we normally do. For some areas, as I've said before, if you're going to be preparing foods that are not going to be cooked, you need to pay special attention. You definitely have to wash and sanitize your hands, wear your gloves, wear a mask. I know that some persons might be iffy about it, especially if the kitchen is hot and so on. But we know the section that you normally do your vegetables or your salads tend to be a little bit cooler and away from all the other I eat areas. So wearing a mask, even if it's just in that area, would be important to try to stem, you know, any contamination or anything like that. All right. Thank you very much, Alicia. Erica Nemard is asking, do you have any recipes for children? She caters for children during lunchtime. Okay. Hi, Erica. Yes, I do have recipes for children. I, you can contact me. Um, by the numbers that Dania has um, 
told you before, or by emailing me, or you can put your email address on here and I would get back to you. So we do have recipes that would cater for children, as you have said. Okay, she's also curious about the packaging for children's products. In packaging for children? Yeah. In, I would think it would be the same packaging, unless of course she has something else in mind. I I haven't I don't seen know, colors any. are making it more attractive as I don't know, but normally you would use the same packaging material. Okay, all right. Um, Sheldon here. Okay, Maxim Losev is also asking any changes to regulations based on health departments based on their perspective. Um, okay, well, regulations still remains the same pretty much, except that now you may have to take into consideration um, how you operate during a pandemic. So the wearing of the mask, um, and this may preferably be the, the N95 mask, or wearing of a face shield as well. And as Alicia mentioned before, this those same modus operandi would still need to be considered. But of course, if you had 10 persons working in a kitchen, now you may need to reduce that number just to maintain the social distance in six feet. And um, of course, the more frequent cleaning of your surfaces, you know, or sanitizing of your surfaces, your packaging. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's just a little bit more intense than what it would normally be. Okay, thanks, Triana. RA is asking where he or she can buy bulk items for vegetarian cooking and baking. And uh, this person is also asking, can they get a list of the environmental packaging companies in Jamaica? A few were mentioned in the presentation. So when we share that presentation, I guess we could, um, you'd see it there. But just to, to mention a few, there is um, con engine, engine Bio, that they offer um, affordable uh, and eco-friendly packaging. What else is there again, Alicia? I had a list there, but uh, I, I seem to forget um, the names. Let me just look for that quickly for the eco-friendly packaging. Right, so we have um, DFL Importers, Conorme Consultancy Limited, which is Engine Bio. Price Smart do sell some. You have Chang's Trading, 728 Holdings Limited, Eco Packaging Solutions Limited. And some of these persons, some of these entities are on Instagram, so you could look, look them up, or you could send us your contact information, email or telephone, and we can provide their number. Okay, all right, we have a few more questions. Sheldon Hay is asking, he actually stated, I would like to get some information as the export requirements to the USA for a recent job request to produce and supply a restaurant in the USA. Please advise if you can. Okay. Um, yes, uh, exporting to the US, it's, it's possible, but it just requires a whole lot more. And um, this definitely would need a lot more time than what we have now to answer that question. I think you indicated your interest in, in um, Called in manufacturing your confectionaries. So I'm not sure if this is the same product you're referring to, but I've indicated that I would be willing to make um, to contact you to set up an appointment so you can come in for a consultation and at that time we can share more information with you. Okay. All right. Michelle Peterkin is asking 
Well, she said it's, she's not sure if this was discussed earlier, but in terms of pricing items, how do you go about pricing items based on quantities? Secondly, what organization um, can actually assist with the calorie counting of food items? Okay. Hi, Michelle. Again, mm -hmm. we did not discuss the pricing for the items. So how do you go about pricing? First, you have to have your recipe. So you use your recipe and your price list. So say you purchase your items from wherever, whichever supermarket will sell price mark, wherever. You're going to have your price list with the actual prices of each item. Okay. So say you use two and a half cups of rice. You know two and a half cups of rice would basically be one pound of rice. Okay. And you would calculate how much per pound for your rice, and then you know how much rice is actually used. You know how much rice is actually used in the recipe, which is two and a half pounds. So you know that for one pound of rice, so one pound of rice, when you calculate your total, is sixty dollars. Then you know, okay, one pound of rice, sixty dollars. Then you calculate how much for your one onion, your carrot, lettuce, whatever else you use. So you're going to have your unit cost as in your cost per pound, and then you're going to find out how much each pound or each onion cost. So say the onion costs 150 and it's three onions in the one pound. You're going to divide the 150 by the three to find out how much one onion costs. And that is what you do for each item in your recipe. If it's one, one teaspoon of, um, say, vanilla or vinegar, you're going to know how much for one bottle of vinegar, how many grams or milliliters is in one teaspoon, which is five. And you know that one bottle of vinegar is 60. So you're going to know that 60 divided by five is going to be how many teaspoons. And then you're going to work out how much teaspoon, how much one teaspoon costs. And that is how you go through and price your menu item. That, sorry, that's how you go through and cost your menu or cost your recipe. So you'll get, by adding all of this, you'll get the cost of your recipe item based on how much ingredient is used. And of and course, that is, that, is just, that is just the cost because right. there are other factors that would have to be borne in mind in terms of so setting the final price. After you cost them. your menu, which is very important for pricing, after you have cost your menu and at the end of it, you say, okay, to complete this recipe that serves five persons, it's $350. That's the cost of preparing this menu costing does not include your overheads, your water, your staffing. This is how you cost your menu, right? Now, after costing, you know you're going to decide what your selling price or pricing your menu. In pricing your menu, you have to bear in mind your overheads, your water, electricity, gas, so on. So if it's going to be 30 cents in 30% food cost percentage um, or above. Most restaurants start at 30 and go below 30, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. All right. And just to add to that, that our business advisory services department is available and provides consultation to persons who are interested in getting more information on how they may cost and price their products. So you may also right. contact them mm -hmm. via email, through social media, or any one of our numbers, 928-516125, if you need to get additional information specifically on how you may cost and price your products. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions. So ladies, I really want to thank you for your presentations today. I believe the information will be something that persons can utilize in assisting them to figure out how they can go forward 
in terms of catering for individuals during this season. You know, it's a quite a peculiar season. However, we have to be able to adapt to, to whatever life throws at us. Okay, Michelle Peter King has said thank you for the information on pricing. Okay, all right, so I believe that we will wrap up for today. I really want to thank you, our presenters, for your presentations. I really want to thank everybody that attended this webinar, and I really hope that you will attend future webinars. As I mentioned earlier, Technical Services, which is the, the department that is facilitating this webinar and this time slot, is responsible for assisting clients with their product development needs. And some of the services that we actually provide includes consultation on food, fashion, product development, as well as we provide other services such as assisting persons to develop their queue management, which is a new, a new service that we're actually looking at. We're also, we also offer supply chain management and process flow supply, along with visual communications and many other um, services. So please don't hesitate to contact us if you need any additional information. As I mentioned before, info at jbdc.net. If you want to send us an email, you may type a question in any of our social media pages, or you may contact us via 876-758-39668. That is the Technical Services Department. If you need any additional information on any of those services, as well, you can contact JBDC's head office at 876-928-516125 if you need any additional information on um, general business advice, business advisory services, or finances, whatever it may be that may fall under that banner, you may contact them for that. Okay, our next, next week, we will be looking at Another equally interesting webinar, we should be exploring a topic pertaining to mass production principles for sewn products. So we will definitely give you more information on that over the next couple of days. It was really a pleasure having you guys here today and we look forward to you attending our future webinars and participating equally within um, those webinars. So thank you very much for your attendance today.